This is the third, that's right, the third, third episode. I almost got caught there. Maybe I was like, was it like that in the movie in Glorious Bastards where you got caught that he was actually like a spy fast bender instead of doing like three beers? He was like three or so. I can't remember which one it was. Listen, <laughs> I'm definitely not German if anyone hasn't been following my career this far, despite some of the rumors you might have heard about my politics. <laughs> so we're on the third episode. Oh that's God. fire, actually. We're on the third episode Jesus. of the best damn league show, period. That's right. Because we've mentioned it, multiple times our producer has indeed actually put the title of the show mm-hmm. correctly onto the overlay now we're gradually getting there boys so much like the lec starting to get into our groove starting to figure out you know the dynamics i want to just start there dom before we get into all the teams i said this on twitter i'm not someone who likes to do that hype thing that everyone does in most esports which is by default people's dream scenario is that the top 10 teams there's nothing between them and any team can be any team on any given you know that whole angle because people want to play up the idea that like you know any team could win worlds wow maybe like club nine cross like in this scenario for real after watching these three weeks of lec before we get into the specifics Dude, there's no, and let, the, the, the joke is this, unless you guys really are willing to try and kick Lucy's football for the fourth straight time with Rogue and go all in on Rogue, spoiler, I won't be doing that anymore. I learned my lesson last year. Unless you're willing to do that route and just not break the habit, Lincoln habits that Lincoln Park style. The league is wide open. Like as much as we've been trying to tear the leagues, like, like I'm with you, Dom. Every other split ever has a tier and the tier tends to go two teams at a time. Top two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, questionable. Maybe you get like a tier with three, two with four. It's almost never the case ever, truly, that teams that make the plus, almost all of them could win. The more I watch, and especially the more the big names have these shaky games and then the underdogs split. Dude, it genuinely feels like with the playoffs start, but in mind, we don't know what these teams like in BO fives. I think it's wide open right now. Yeah, I think it's wide open. I think that there's like a six teams that are starting to separate each, themselves from each other. So you have like the Vitality, Mad Lions, uh, G2. I think Misfits is now kind of broken away in yeah, my yeah. line from that yeah, like yeah. sixth and seventh. I feel like they're starting to become more legit. So I'd say that they're they're moving up. But it looks like we've got a, a top six and a bottom four, which is yes. pretty good for playoffs because that's that's really what you want. You'd rather have a, a top six and a bottom four than a top five and a bottom five because sure. you don't want a playoff match to just be completely wasted. So I'm pretty pretty happy with what we've seen so far the split. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that there's just there's just a lot that that is left to be determined. I feel like a lot of players aren't really playing like themselves yet. Like you know that a couple of these guys are just going to be a lot better than they are eventually. Um, so I think it really just depends on who actually gets into form. You know, there's actually, uh, there was a famous split of the LCS. You'll know. You're not hearing that beep sound in the background, are you? No. I'm oh, just checking because I was saying, no, I, this is my PC, so it's set up stupidly. Basically, okay. uh, in the split that famously TSM got back on top with Bjergsen when they won 3-2 to two in that summer split when Loco coached for the first time. If people don't remember, that was the most fire LCS split ever because what happened was during the split... There was literally something like four or five teams that were number one at one point in time. There was like the LMQ, there was CLG, even Dignitas. Dignitas. The joke was TSM never was. Cloud9 was at the end. You know, and by the end of the split, this is what people don't get. This is why I'm giving this analogy, because what it ended up being was how you placed wasn't even based on the other top teams. It was based on how well you farmed the bad teams. Like, funnily enough, your team was considered a bad team at the time, the cursed team, yep. because people didn't expect you to beat fucking CLG and all those, you know. So at the time, your playoff spot was going to be, do I or do I win every game, basically, against the bad teams? If I do, I've been sure to get a good spot. But even then, the playoff then just becomes the bracket. It's not like I'm the number one team. It's like, if you're the number one team, but you get the number four team and they're your counter, you go out the first round with That can happen. Like, I feel like that's why it's interesting, because normally, like I said in the intro, normally the other way you can do it, think of past G2 and Fnatic teams, is even when the Rogue or the Mad Lions team comes along, you just do the veteran move and you go, wait till playoffs. You know, they're going to fall apart. They've never been in that situation. The core that's existed, they'll find a way, like G2, they'll always find a way to come back. That doesn't even exist now, dude. There is no team that has, like, the, the true core. Even, like, Rogue lost, like, their key elements. Like, right now, the crazy thing to me is, like, I can't even say I can project any of these teams in the playoffs yet. I don't know who's going to be good. Yeah, I, I have no idea either. I mean, the one that, that would stick out, would you, you'd normally think that Fnatic, with their roster, should have that. But it's, it's not showing that to me right now either so like they should we go into them first they're the obvious team because here's the thing i'll set it up like this quickly obviously on paper they look like they had the best off season off season moves not least because you know vitality you know new york to work out these ones look like this should surely work eventually the problem i have is this this is why you can never let the record fool you because even when they were undefeated they had a few that were like that's a bit questionable those questionable ones now are becoming losses dude like now now i actually start to feel like they could bleed a bunch of games this split 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, and they had a pretty hard week this week. Up until this week, you pretty much just yes. saw them shitting on the bad teams. Yep. Now they have Rogue and G2 in the same week. They lost both of them. And I, I feel like they just don't have much um, connectivity between their lanes yes. and their jungler. It just feels like they're all isolated. They're all doing their own thing at the same time. So it's not like when you see Humanoid get a huge lead mid that translates to anything. It's just like that lead stays in mid. So until something happens in Humanoid's lane, there's not going to be something that that's going to break the game wide open. So I feel like that's the, the biggest part that I'm not seeing with Fnatic is I'm not seeing mid lane leans transfer into bot lane leads or jungle leads transfer into like top lane leads into mid lane leads. Like it feels like everyone is just kind of playing their own game and they show up for objectives when, when they spawn and they hope that they're just going to win based off that. I just want to see more like uh, just more activity on the map. I feel like when you have a hella song team, it should be pretty easy to get things going. Um, like especially in the mid game and we're not really seeing too much of that. And I feel like that's part of the reason why you're getting some of these really long games. Like you know, the Astralis game lasts like 40 minutes because they're all just kind of doing their own thing. It kind of looks like a solo key game almost. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the funny thing is maybe when we get later to like the Mad Lions team, some of the other teams I think are way more decisive and seem like they know kind of what to do, even if it's not always the right move. The problem I have with Fnatic, you've nailed it. The player I want to bring out was Razor because I was someone last year who I did think, I low-key thought he was better than Inspired at times, dude. I really thought he maybe even should have been the MVP of the split last year when you consider. Look who he's working with, like fucking still rookies people and like the only old players Vandry had on his team. Like, man, mm -hmm. that's a joke. The idea that he was as good as he was. But I'll tell you this. When you think of the makeup of the Misfits team, that was a fucking solo lane team. And now, in theory, his best lane is supposed to be his bot lane. And he doesn't look like he is connected at all. Like you were just saying that about Hillisang. You would think if you're a top jungler, Hillisang is your dream support. He's going to constantly be making players with you. He'll even go in first. Like you connect up with him. You can even get probably some sick kills on the enemy jungler if you do it right, you know. But dude, he doesn't look at the moment like they're on the same page at all. They have a different vision of the game as far as I can tell. I feel like it's maybe just him trying to play with Hillisong. Like he, instead of just him playing like himself and just being confident in what he wants to do, I feel like he's the type of guy where he, he's looking at all of his lanes. He's playing with all these big names and it feels like he's not like embracing what his strengths were. I mean, his pathing is still fine for the most part, but his mechanics have like fallen off a cliff. Yeah. You watch some of these fights. There's just some weird decisions that are going on. Um, mechanically i mean obviously in the game that we had this week versus g2 you had the e flash procking the zillion ult in the mid lane and then suddenly the whole fight is just turned upside down um instantly i feel like the problem is that razor is trying to be someone he's not like he doesn't really need to be you know uh yankos or something like that like he can just be razor and that's yes. good enough um so i feel like he still <coughs> definitely has it within him but I mean, I guess that just the fact that he's playing on this team and he does have Hillisong in his support, I feel like that is affecting him almost more negatively than if he had somebody who was like shit, you know, or he could just be like himself um, and and just do whatever he wants to do on the map. So I, my take is that I feel like the fact that his players are like so historic and he's got so many big names on his team is almost making him play worse as opposed to like nice. having advantages and allowing you to just hit like a tier that other people can't hit because their laners will put them there. Yeah, I mean, that says I've no doubt it was probably easier for him, the fact that a bunch of his players were rookies as well in the past team. So it's more like, you know, I'm the veteran. Like, I make the players. You guys adapt to me. Cause I'm with you on that one. I've always thought that old adage from American sports is a great one. Like, whatever got you to this point, you stick with that. You don't just go, right, I'm at the point now. But it's like, basically, this is why NA teams, I think, have been shit at Worlds so many years. They get to Worlds and go, right, forget everything we were doing else. Like, what was the point of the year then? What were we practicing for? So anyway, yeah, I still have big concerns about Fnatic. Like, again, with a roster like that, I mean, I'll put it this way. If it fails, it's one of the most spectacular failures ever. Like, that is like a mega roster on paper. So I still feel like they're going to figure it out. But as I say, if you're projecting to a future playoffs and this isn't a team with a true core, like those, the bot lane can't just be the core. You know, like That can't be the core of a whole team. I'm thinking of things like the jungle, the support, the mid. Like, to me, they're the most important roles, typically. They haven't got that figured out at all. So why don't we do G2 then? Because you brought them up. First and foremost, by the way, this is why I do love the LEC. Because when G2 plays Fnatic, all those past years, G2's had the upper hand, you know, it's all about them. They're going to win or lose and mean whatever. Not only did they get to beat the Fnatic team that's beat all these players and all these fucking big moves. Meanwhile, Ocelot, you know, he's being criticized. Everything's done a bad move. But obviously it spawned the fucking legendary Ocelot meme, didn't he? Did the Ronaldo? I'm like, did it, did it. That is the thing. <laughs> Understand this, Fnatic. Even if your team became dominant, you don't. Sam Matthews can't do that. He can't pull that off. So what I love, Dom, <laughs> is this. This is a real point I want to make about G2. As much as I still don't think long term, Flacken is going to turn out to be a great ADC, and I don't think they can be like past G2 teams. 
As I, I actually totally now, beyond even just the playing, see also why they got Tagama Smith. He has brought back the fucking real G2 flavor. He actually <laughs> is embracing it. Because you know what? Last year, people might think, oh, maybe it was just Perks. No, it wasn't just that. It's more like when Perks was gone, and more importantly, they weren't winning. A lot of them just didn't seem to vibe with it. They seemed a bit more like, nah, let's wait until we're winning before we sort of really try to banter. And obviously the whole reckless thing, maybe they didn't know how he would fit in the equation. Even though as a team, they're not as good as the old grit one. It feels like the actual vibes back. Like, I think they are going to be like the shit talkers and yeah. the troublemakers now. It's fun. I'm glad. I mean, I think I think a lot of that comes from Flackett. I mean, his his social media personality is just like... Oh, he's had uh, some good ones. Yeah, Yeah, sure. I mean, he, he he's just... When he tries to ratio his own boss repeatedly, like on, on a daily basis. I mean, he ratioed the Pope. So like, That's what true. can you do? <laughs> yeah. like, if you, That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you ratio the Pope, I think you, you, you take that one. I think the problem with G2 is they don't have like... I don't know. Every game feels like they could win or lose. When you watch E2, you don't know which games like uh, like they could be losing super hard early game to Fnatic, then somehow still win the game. Like Caps is behind an ungodly amount uh, of CS mid because he took Ghost and not TP. And the game versus Misfits, that should have been an easy win. It should have been a walk in the park. And then they just did the classic elder throw. I mean, it was literally reminiscent of last split, the same exact elder situation. Throw Elder and then some somehow by by like God's grace they end up winning that game. But like you don't feel like this team is actually consistent and stable. You just feel like, yeah, I mean, they're they're like hype driven. You know, like I feel like they really believe in themselves and they just get in there. And if they play well, that's great. If not, like they're not gonna have the the structures and things that are going to just carry them through some times where the team is just playing poorly, which is something that I've seen a lot um happen to teams. It reminds me of like Shulka last spring, where they had the same type of vibe, and I don't know if this this has to be because BB's on the team or not, but they had the same vibe where they were winning, and then they dropped like eight games in the middle where you just don't know what's happening, and then suddenly they just like get their mojo back, they're winning again. You don't feel like they're actually doing anything that different. It just feels like their confidence is different at different points throughout the year. So I'm, I'm really wondering if G2 is going to have that like level of consistency to ever be a true top team, or if they're just going to continue bouncing back between like, oh, we played well this game, oh, we played shit this game. Like, what are what are they taking between games to actually level up their play over the course of the entire split. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, that's why I made it more like what they're doing outside of the server. Because my problem in the server still is like, I still don't really believe in this roster yet. Like I, whatever they saw in those scrims and those tryouts that they believed was going to be epic. Because by the way, unless you think they're lying and they were trying to save money, totally legitimate opinion if people want to think that. They really did pick this thinking that they were geniuses and this was like some super genius pickup and like, you know, we could have gone with big names. We went with this guy because he's like the, the truth or whatever. I haven't seen that yet. And so my problem is I still don't really know what, like in line with what you're saying, I don't know what their identity is still doing. And they, it can't, unfortunately, I'll repeat it just one more time. I'm not going to go into it, obviously. It can't just be Caps wins us the game because Caps doesn't do that anymore. Like at the moment, he's still he's still having his issues, mate. Like he's yeah, clearly I mean, not bad, but some, it, there's still a game missing for, some, for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with that. But the way that I see it is like, if Caps is not even playing well and this team is five and two in, in like the first seven games, like that's okay. a pretty good sign. Like he, he's... He's still not looking like Caps. If he started looking like old Caps where he's just smurfing on everyone, he's just the best mid laner by far in LEC. With how open LEC is right now, why could this team not just be the best team? Why could they not just be the best team in LEC and, and win spring? I, I don't see why not. Like, not I don't impossible, think Flockhead will. I don't think that Flockhead will hold them back to that degree where it's like him being a rookie will just make it so they can't win. I think BB will be able to. I mean, we've seen him win a championship in LCS. You know that that guy can perform versus good players. If Caps is in God mode, Yankos is doing his thing. Targamas looks solid. I feel like this team should be good enough to win. I just, to me, I'm still just waiting for Caps. Like, I want to see the real Caps play, not this Victor with Ghost that's down 40 CS to Humanoid. Like, I don't know who that guy is. Also, like, let's be real. Like, he should have died way more in that game. I mean, oh, the first course. shuffle, like, Razor just missed his Q. It was a free kill. Like, he could have literally into that whole game with the way that he was playing that lane phase. So, I'm... I'm just waiting for old G2, old, old G2 caps, man. Like, I don't know if he needs to change the name back or what, or shave his head. Like, I don't care what the fuck this guy does, but do something to bring back that guy because that guy was a fucking beast. And the thing that concerns me is like, when caps was that good, he was what rank one in solo queue in like uh, in 2020, right? Then I look at his solo queue stats and he's like playing the game a lot. So it's not like he's, he's burnt out and he's not playing the game. When I last checked, he was like top 10. I'll check right now. Let's see. He's ranked 12. Like this guy is actually playing the game just as much as he was before. I hope he still loves the game the same, same way he does. But if he's like in that form, something is like happening where I feel like he doesn't believe in himself as much on stage as, as he did before. I don't think that it's the, the level of his competition just being so good that he can't no beat them the same yeah. way. I feel like it's coming from like within him. Like I think that he just feels differently about the competition himself. 
let's get into that because that's a good sidebar we could do. So one, I will say this. I pointed out last week, but I'll do a different version of it this time. It's this is why when people have debates about people's careers, I mean, everyone should have seen this with the LeBron James debate. You can try and track and figure out like, oh, where would he be in a couple of years and what would he have to do? But until their actual career ends, you don't really know where they rank because what you do is when they go to their peak, you get super high off the peak and you think, fuck, if he maintains, this is the best ever. Like everyone did with caps. The problem is like, it's it, there's not many careers that people have where you just bang out for five straight years and every year you're a genius. Like people tend to have a couple of years where they're amazing, some where they're not as much. Maybe you rediscover yourself if you're an auto amnesty or something. You know, there's a, you have a career arc and up and down. Well, my problem is this. This is also one of the reasons I know it hasn't aged as well on the perks side. Why I always favoured perks over caps because I always felt like I know well, again this is aged terribly, but with the old way perks used to play, I mean <laughs> okay. I felt like you could play it consistently and not die that much. Like obviously that's aged terribly. I understand. <laughs> Yeah, okay, that's, I'll, right. I'll, I'll give you that part but I felt right. like essentially he knew how to be a mage midline player better right whereas the problem I have with this and I always said this about both Caps and Hillisang that playing style is super effective when it really works and when it drops off 10% it can fucking wreck you you can either it like this lose your whole identity or you just become an inter you just, I mean this even I would even argue maybe it happened to Hillisang a few weeks and years gone past you know where he just lost his mojo you look at obviously the Nautilus Games were the infamous ones where he just looked like he was just in, in the yeah. game. He just and like, ran it. You're like, what are you even going for here? Like, there wasn't, there was nothing there, you know. So here's mm-hmm. the problem I have. Now, obviously, in Thorin fashion, I'm gonna sort of I'll get I'll tell you straight up, I'm gonna back into a take that sort of makes like Frog and look really good again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here's why. All right. I made a video years ago about this topic, right? Where one of the worst things about pro players is especially back then, they have very limited terminology to explain themselves, to articulate themselves. And you know, it's like a lot of pros also aren't very articulate people. They don't read, they don't, they're not talking about the game much. They're just, you know, it's all memes and just playing the game. So the problem I always used to have was literally the only description, and it used to be in the brain of a player, binary, was you're either aggressive or, are you ready? Passive. And those two, mm-hmm. first of all, that's such an enormous spectrum. And this is my problem with it, Dom. You can have a player who's defensive, who's incredible at it. Guess what? Reckless would fit into that. You can have a player who's super aggressive, who's fucking shit at it. Spoiler, there's been plenty of middle well, like, right? There's plenty of... Oh, oh, there's, a good one as well. there's plenty of players who try that. We all know that. So my mm-hmm. problem is this. First of all, I did a video where I said, the way I, the way I separate it like this is, to me, passive typically means you don't take initiative. You sort of you, you wait for them to do something. By default, you don't want to attack people. You, you know, you want to just farm the game up, right? I think a better term for certain people who are, who are master mage players, Froggen, Power of Evil, just people points in their career, Time Jensen, Bjergsen, they're defensive players. That's the difference. It's not that they're just passive, like, oh, I'm not going to do it now. It's that in their where they're at in their career at that point, they go, right, look, I can't be the guy who's a maniac, actually. In fact, that's, I don't believe in myself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be, uh, play a bit more conservative, but I'm going to play it defensively. The reason I say defensively, by the way, is because famously, you couldn't say if Rogan is a passive laner. You could say he's a passive mid-lane player, as he doesn't try to roam as much. In lane, he's still going to contest the CS. He's still going to be ahead and say, still going to push you out of lane if he can. He's not under his tower, is he? So to me, this is the one area I'm bringing up now. In the same way as famously with junglers, you have people like Peter who are fucking sick mechanically. But then if you go to a Cinderhawk patch, he's in trouble. That to a fan doesn't make sense because what they think is, well, if he's that mechanically genius, I mean, usually it's the bomb ass players who just play, you know, the tank. So he must be able to do that as well. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, that does not mean that the super mechanical player could be as good as the defensive tank player who's just like a master of pathing and I think that's what you're seeing with some of these players now like Caps hasn't yet figured out how to be a conservative player mate, and just be like a mage player as much like he, he hasn't got because it's a different mindset to him so either in my opinion he goes rolls the clock back he rediscovers himself and he becomes Caps again or well, this has to be a different he has to reinvent himself as Caps I guess to be a different player by the way he could be a much more skilled version of Power Evil and you could like I said last week you could do a lot with that still if he knows that that's his identity though you gotta pick I, I think my issue with that is like in, in season in season uh, ten, he was smurfing like he was running it on on all oh, those for sure. in like, summer. Yeah, yeah. In, in summer, he was literally like, "Give yeah, me a soul stealer on any mage, and I will carry the whole fucking yes. game alone. Like, get the fuck out of my way. I don't care if all five of or all four of you guys are inting the entire game. I will still find a way to win us enough games that we're gonna make playoffs and like win and go to worlds and all that shit." So, for me, I just don't understand like where that aggression went like i don't know if he just doesn't feel comfortable doing that but it's not like he's losing lanes by being too aggressive no, no. it's like oh like 
when Hillisong was inting, it was like Hillisong was still playing like Hillisong. It was just like way yes, too crazy. Yes, the results like, were bad. Yeah, of course. Calm the fuck down with what you're doing. But when I see Caps playing, it's like he's a different player. And I feel like that's that that's the issue there. Also, to your to your Perks comment, there's a couple things I wanted to hit there. Your Perks comment, I feel like Perks has actually looked like in the last four games, like first three, if we can just throw those out of our mind for Vitality, yes. be like, they fucking ran it down week one. Half of them had COVID, like whatever the fuck happened there. It was it was horrible. If you look at the last four games, it was the only like, thing sick about those games. games. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, it was the only <laughs> thing sick about those games. The the four games that they played afterwards, I feel like this team looks pretty solid. I oh, mean, what, course, they're three yeah. and one. The one yes. game they lost was to Rogue. And like, Perks is not lo- losing lane. He's not no, doing no. some ridiculous ints. Like he's playing the lanes properly. He's playing like an actual, like good mid laner in Europe. So I feel like that's the part that pisses people off so much about Perks. It's like, you want him to be like, if you're a Perks hater, you want him to be bad for long enough where you can really yes. shit on him. And he's never bad for long enough for you. No, no. You can actually just continue nailing in the cop. Yes. Like, look at this guy. He's a piece of shit. Yep. He's look at this bum ass mid laner. You never actually get that out, out of him. Like he'll be bad for like two weeks and then he'll have like two good weeks. Or he'll be like bad going into playoffs, but he's going to get shit on. Then he'll like slightly outperform what you think in playoffs or he'll go to worlds and you're like, okay, well now he'll definitely fail. And then he just gets to quarterfinals. That's the problem with Perksaders. That's why they get so fucking mad is yes. they don't actually get time to, to truly hate on him. They don't get what you get with reckless. We're like now for like all of, <laughs> yeah, exactly. all of spring split, you're just going to be laying on the <laughs> NFL <course>. takes. <laughs> yes. No, by the way, exactly. dude, I'll even give you an example and I'll even give a side bar which people aren't going to understand because they're going to score like as always if i ever give advice people go but you do that so when i say or what i'm about to say about being a hater they're going to go but you just do that to reckless even though as i've just pointed out i mean roll the clock back i just said he was really good at his fucking style i just didn't think he was the best and i hate his fans no i don't hate him i just fucking hate you his fans i despise (laughs) you and i know you have to watch so fuck it you're going to take this pain you're going to get this work loaded looks Right. Here's what I'll say is this, right? Jesus. This is the problem. As you say, that it, it, it's like, it's like if basically if we're on a meter, I mean, this kid just used all this orgasm. They're so close to coming, Dom. They're like, everything's what the four players been incredible. He's in a bunch of games early, obviously in cloud nine, you know, he's looking shit even on his champs. He's picking Renekton, look like an idiot. They're like, oh, this is amazing. Oh, incredible. They're so, oh, just a little bit more. Just, I'm so close. But that's when he would always either playoffs rolls around or he would have like a mega clutch game. And that's the moment <laughs> where they're always like, ah, oh, fuck. And then the worst thing is they have to go silent for a week and I'll tell you the example this is why I'm going to give people advice to not be a hater you can dislike a player but if you actually hate as in you sort of like you're basing you're basing your pleasure metric on them failing if that's going to be what's going to make you happy if you do it with a great player you are in for a bad fucking time because here's the example yep. when I, I first you, started I, I'll give you a quick I, I, let me, let me oh, yeah, go on, I'm a LeBron hater there we I'm go. LeBron perfect. Hater. Perfect. And and I go through the same thing. I'm like, look, like, yes. look at him right now with this bum ass yes. team that he constructed. Like, he's gonna fucking be like, he's still like actually insane. Like, I'm oh, not actually mega. so delusional where I think he's a bad yeah, yeah. player. Like, he's definitely a top five player yeah, in the of league. Course. And they'll probably end up being something. But like right now, I'm like, I'm right there, man. It's just I just need him to like either not make playoffs or go out in the first round yes. again, something like that, and then I can like you know really get my true LeBron hatred out. So. Oh, that's a great example, by the way, because the other one is LeBron. And I've had the same experience both in both sports. In the NBA, it was LeBron because here's the thing. Remember, it also isn't him again. That's why I'm making this key distinction. It's his fans. His fans were the ones who from literally like 2010 onwards were like, he's already the GOAT in my opinion. Like, I think he, you know, he'd have like, he had like zero rings or whatever. He's, I think he's already better than John. So already that makes you start going like, I uh, hope he fails because like, you yeah. want them to be wrong. And then the other player, obviously, by the way, is Tom Brady because I'm just a fan of Peyton Manning and Aaron Rodgers. So this mm-hmm. is why, and I, and, I'll say the other thing as well. The other reason I also don't hate these players is because I found as a as a as a byproduct of sports, when you have a player you like, if they battle a rival and they're both really mega, eventually you just inevitably, if you're not a douchebag, you like start to appreciate the other player as well, don't yeah, you? Of course. You start to go, oh, actually, he is fucking insane. I've got to give him that, have you? Like, even if you're a LeBron here, I'm not a huge fan, mate. When he did do that comeback against the Warriors, I was like, that is pretty fucking sick. I can't yeah, lie. Like, I mean, that he, is actually balling. Yeah, of course. I mean, that was insane. <laughs> and also, like, the way his game has evolved is actually oh, really mega. impressive. Because yeah. he used to, like, just not be able to shoot yes. really. Like, I mean, he could always shoot, but, like, you know what I mean? Like, he, he could only like, go one like, direction and do it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now he's like, uh, he, he's got yes. like a good solid, like, out, like outside game as well. Like it's, and he's fucking still athletic at 37. Like yes. it, it's tough for me to be a LeBron hater, but no, it's, it's actually that I hate the fans and I hate the comparison to like Michael Jordan as somebody who got to watch Michael Jordan. I, I mean, you got to watch Michael Jordan. I mean, you were like, you were what, like already like in your thirties. I was 35. Yeah, Jordan. exactly. Yeah. I was like courtside seats. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yeah, you got to watch Michael Jordan's career. I mean, Michael Jordan was like, so fucking good. Like you got like all those like Warriors series. Like it was like the Warriors series for LeBron, like three years in a oh, row type times, shit. Like yeah. it was it was great to watch that guy. So 
I don't know. I, I'm I'm more just like a Michael Jordan lover, and that makes yes, me like that's a great way to say it. Yes, a LeBron hater. You what know? you do is this. First of all, for the sake of his fans, you can still enjoy the film, but only in that sense. You enjoy their pain, essentially. You, you drink their tears, like the little reckless hair, fan tears. And the other angle is, you just think, well, it's just preference, isn't it? I, like, I personally prefer Peyton Manning, okay, but for different reasons. Obviously, I like different things about his game. But I'll, I'll finish the Brady point. The Brady point was this. I used to be the guy where, because I wanted his fans to shut the fuck up, Obviously, there was, first of all, that massive gap where he didn't win the Super Bowl. So I was like, he's never going to win it again. It was all like the fucking defensive court. Yep. So you idiots. You yeah, how did that age? Yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> listen, not great, but okay. And then this <laughs> okay. is the one that really killed me because I know everyone in media also got fucked by this if they didn't like it. Every year you were like, well, now he's 38. Now he's 39. Look, yep. it's all, look. He's, uh, enjoy this last year. Enjoy that ring, Dick. And that's over for him. And obviously the joke is, I mean, listen, I will say, I don't think I underestimate Tom Brady as much as HGH. You understand, fans? <laughs> I'll always have the sickest takes on every sport. So, okay, anyway, the joke is, obviously, it's like fucking fine mind, isn't he? And if anything, th- thanks to that fountain of youth he found, magically, he looks like he's about 10 years younger now, Dom, than he did when he was 35. When I, so, okay, fair play. But as I say, yeah, you've just got to appreciate it. So if we bring this back, that's why the Perks example is the perfect one. Because, listen, we're not just going to constantly blow our horn on this every week, but it's like, guys, yeah. it was only one year. And the year included a split victory. Go to MSI and then go to top eight worlds out the hardest group ever. If that's your down year, if that's the bad year, guys, what, yeah. like, do, do you understand the stock market? Like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> you guys are selling that point. What? Like, again, oh, I don't know if he's going to make it, but I'll tell you what, we can spin this back and LEC. You paid a very accurate point earlier. Humanoid is all right as a middle, and it doesn't look like he is this monster who's leading his whole team. You go over, you look at caps. He ain't caps right now. You go, like, actually, uh, ironically, by the way, people like Perks and Lars look like the best mids right now. Like, actually, right now, the world, as much as everyone would have said, there's no way Perks would be the best. Dude, he's on course to potentially be. Yeah. I mean, look, I did a mid lane tear list. Who did you have? So my... My number one, I think you just have to say Larson. Like, even though I did, oh, like, do. I, I, just the performances, if, yeah. If, if you're just looking at the first seven games, I think you have to say Larson yes. number one. Number two, I think Vedio has been having like an insane. He's split. pretty I good. Feel like, yeah, I feel like this guy is actually like he's the truth. Like he's really doing it this this split. Yes. And then like third, I forgot like, who did I have third. I mean, I had humanoid third, and then I had Maybe perks Pokes? fourth and caps fifth. Like so, I actually okay. have perks over caps right now, just because I feel like caps has had yeah. so many weird games. And then when you saw perks play against caps, like. I mean, obviously, that's not a matchup that Corky is supposed to win or anything, but Caps was kind of invisible for the entire yes. game. So it's one of those things where I, I think it's really hard to rate mid leaders of the LEC. Um, but what, what's so crazy to me is how close they are, because it's not like before in LEC 2020 with Caps, you'd be like, oh, you know, he's the best, right? It would be like, no, he is like two tiers above. Yes. The next, like the next person is not even human compared to him. Like it is you're, you're on different levels, different planes of existence right now. So for me, I think the crazy thing is like, how is Caps in the mix? Like, how is he, how is he mortal? Like to, to me, it's not a surprising that Humanoid went from in my mind being like the first to the third. It's like, how is Caps even close to the rest of these people based off what yes. we've seen before? And especially like in Metas, like, like you would think that like you have the ability to play LeBlanc right now. That is, that is a Caps champion. You have the ability to play Silas into a lot of these champions. Silas was a Caps champion. TX Some of these picks good. are weird. I'm with you on that, man. All of those champions are like Caps champions. You think about yep. Caps like taking over games on TF, taking over games on Silas. You remember his like Oriana, like Zoe, LeBlanc, like he could play everything. It wasn't like he was just only good on a few picks like Aurelia and Akali and those aren't in the meta anymore. And that's what led you to this situation. It's confusing as to like what could have happened between these like two, this like year essentially. And it's not even a year to be honest. At this point last year, with G2 doing as well as they did, people still thought it was like a super team that was going to yeah. win everything. It of wasn't course. like... Yep. It wasn't people have like written people. that, dude. If you go back to the moment before summer playoffs began, the two top teams in the league were G2 and Rogue. And mm-hmm. the logic was, well, Rogue will fail, so G2 probably makes it, right? Yeah. People thought they could be the yeah. best team, not like not make the playoffs. Absolutely. Like, oh, they possibly could be the best team. So it's not actually been that long that we've, we've seen this. It just feels like it's been a yes. lot longer because there's been like a couple failures at the end there. So spring playoffs, summer playoffs that have made you like really, like really stuck in your mind is like, oh, this is a, this is a failure for G2. Therefore it's a failure for caps. So, I mean, that's just something that, that has been like bugging me every single time I watch G2 is it's so hard to look at that team and not focus on mid because the core of that team was course, caps. Yeah. It was caps and Yankos. Like they were, they were the middle of the map. Like those are really important players. And I feel like Yankos is still good. I feel like he's still pretty much playing at the level that, yes. that he was for like the last year or so. I don't think that he's, the best jungler by far in LEC, but I still think he's like a top three jungler in the league. 
I just want to see the other part of it. I want to see the real G2 yes. come out because that's how this team actually ends up winning, uh, winning a split. Yeah, those are two factors I want to hit. So first of all, when Jankos wins his MVP, one of them he won with Caps, it was the duo. It was how he played with Caps that was so amazing. He sort of like, here's the thing, in my opinion... Jankos is also, funny enough, done the jungle equivalent of the mid lane player who goes from the fucking assassin player to the mm-hmm. amazing mid. He's done the one where I was the mechanical leasing out play you all foot shit, which he only does. You notice he sort of like skill picks that when he thinks it's just like necessary. But he became like everyone because the, the idea is the reason you become more conservative is you know what works. You try and just take high percentage chances instead of doing like high variance gambles, right? Essentially, when you become older, it's a young man's game to gamble everything because you've, 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 you've been broke already your whole life. You've never had success. The problem I have, he Jankos is this. He will look not very good when his team isn't good because at this point in his career, he's an activator. His job is to activate other people and that, that's how you win the game. He isn't going to be like fucking self-made when he has one of those guy games where he just smashes the whole game and it's just, you can see raw mechanical outplay. He's not going to do that. And then on the caps angle, you've hit a perfect filter for me as well because as someone who studied all the mage players, I'll tell you right now the difference between the master mage player and the one you've got to be worried about and Corky is the fucking pick right now because Corky is a pick you might know, they might see the reference I'm making here to how Reckless had certain champions in the bottom lane that were like this. If you play Corky and you're playing not the, you're not playing an aggressive style, you could just, you can just be invisible and never die. You just fuck off all the fights all the time. You just stay slightly too far back, throwing those fucking bombs. Like, oh, that's it. Like, mate, that's one of those champions that you, you can tell if someone picked it because they're like, I can sort of play it in this matchup. So I'm like begrudgingly picking it. Or you can tell if someone picks it, like, I'm going to win this whole game with this guy. Because I have, I have to say, like, I'm just in general in LEC, there's some mad questionable fucking package uses on that champion. Don't play that champion if you don't know how the fucking package works. You idiot. That's the most OP shit ever if you know how that works. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it is fucking OP, but I, I feel like the other thing is like, there's so many, there's champions like like Quirky that you can just tell mid laners don't like playing. It's like the equivalent of Jarvan in the jungle where no one's sitting there practicing Jarvan like in solo queue. Like, oh, I'm going to put in a bunch of Jarvan games, make sure that my Jarvan is clean. Like no one likes playing that shit. Same way in, in competitive, I feel like people don't really embrace that champion being in the meta. They're like, oh, I'll just pick it because I have to, but they're not going to practice it. And they're not going to be like the person in scrims. It's like, yeah, let's make sure we get a couple quirky games this week. They'll be like, yeah, it's probably going to be banned. No use of playing it. Like we're probably going to ban it on red side anyway. So if it's up like on, in, on stage, I'll play it and I'll play it well every single time. But you can just tell the teams that actually understand what quirky is and how to play with it. And teams that just, just sit, let it sit there and just have no pressure the entire game. Don't fight on the right timings with package. You see these random package timers all across the world. Like I've been losing my mind in LPL seeing people take it a minute and a half before dragon. We just need I to know. like, and it, I swear <laughs> it just becomes, it's because Corky is a boring champion. Yeah. People don't like fucking playing Corky. Yeah. So they're not going to actually perfect it. They're not going to hone it in the same way that I'm sure these guys want to be like a master LeBlanc or like as a jungler, you want to be a really good Lee Sin. Like a lot of people just don't view the champion as having enough depth for them to really invest time and become uh, like a real like master of the champion. Here's the fun thing. Let's do the Rogue topic. So obviously Rogue by results is the best team in the league. I'll even say I have to now change that sentence before I was hitting. I'm like, yeah, they played the bad team. Now they played the good teams and beat them as well. Like mm-hmm. at this point you have, at this point we just have to give it up to them. Again, no one can know they're doing playoffs. They've still got some flaws. I'm sure we'll get into them now, but you just look at the team this is a team you can say now, if I'm talking about the flaws of the other one, they have a completely coherent identity. They seem to know what they want to play. They've got their fucking picks down and the best players on the team are playing really well right now. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I, I think the Rogue did exactly what we talked about last week. We're like, hey, if this team plays like mage mid, like tank or like whatever, like like weak side top laner, a jungler that has the ability to gank and then like a strong bot lane, this team is going to be one of the strongest. Like that is exactly what they did. That is how they beat Fnatic. Like they literally just did that. That's all you have to do to, to, to be an insane team like that. So I feel like that's the thing that I really like about, about Rogue is that right now they're actually just doing what's best for them. They're not trying to master everything. They're going to master one thing and then they're fitting other champions into the play style that they want to play as opposed to the opposite where they're like, oh, well, you know, we we want to pick this champion. Let's let's just play something that we don't actually know how to how to how to play where we don't have win conditions that are obvious to us that we know how to execute. So, for example, in the Vitality game, I really like the Volibear pick. I'm like, Malrong can be Malrong on yes. that pick. He doesn't have to be like he doesn't have to be playing Lee Sin or Jarvan. He can still gank. He can still do what he wants. It's not something that's really highly prized in the jungle. People aren't contesting Volibear. It's not the best jungler in the world, but it works for them. That's the type of stuff that I would want to see. Like I'm so much, I'm so down to see like Odo play an Aatrox game if it looks like a good pick. Then 
watch him have to play like Fiora or something like that, where it's just not an Odo champion. So obviously these players are going to fucking hate hearing this shit. Like if I call Odo tomorrow and I'm like, yo, dude, like, by the way, like, just stop trying to play like carry tops. Like you just, you just can't, they'll they'll be fucking pissed. But how much better is Odo when he's playing like, or how much better is he? he? People think I'm like trolling when I say that. Like I actually mean it as a term of affection. He is the best at taking a beating on the, like on the champions that aren't the carry champion. He's fucking unbelievable. Basically, if people don't get it, it, he's like like mastered the whole mind. I'm in some ways. Listen, I take any, (laughs) Listen, the joke is that I do block it. So you, you, I take the L, but I ensure I don't ever take a second L. Or, or more like I don't see the second L. I'm like philosophical. <laughs> if a second L happens, but I don't see it, did it in fact happen? Solipsistic view <laughs> on the universe, but you know, not at all self indulgent or narcissistic. Okay. What I would say is this. Perfect. This is where people also, I'll tie it into our perks analogy about the stock going down. Dude, during Worlds, you, you might remember this. I was one of the only people who said that Rogue actually had a chance to do something in that group. Everyone else like, you thought we can't possibly go. You're going to get destroyed. Look, it's down one. And I was like, mate, just the fucking roster they have. Look how good those players in isolation were. They're best of ones. You can trip over and win one of those. You know, like that can happen. Now, here's the thing. Yes, on paper, they lost their two best players, the most important players on the team in terms of like fan voting and who people thought were the best. I hope people now realize how good some of those other players were, including Otto Amne, because another player, dude, if you think the Perks one's bad, People do this with Odo Amne every single year of his career. They're just like, I'm out on him. He's trash now. It's like, mate, at what he does, he's still one of the absolute best. Now, that style that you're talking about, that's his fucking bag. And when he gets in that bag, he's never going to be in a slump long, mate. He might have a week or two. He doesn't do it. He might lose a big game. I will say he's had a few playoff games. He's choked. But you put him in just random regular season, best of all, he's definitely going to get his shit back. Of course. And he's yeah. seen it in these games. People like him and Larson, they've maybe a little bit more limited playing style wise, but when they're in their bag, they are some of the best. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the the thing that you mentioned there is actually pretty interesting. The fact that Rogue were perceived to lose their two best players, right? Like Han Summon and Spide were supposed to be the two best players yes. on that team, and somehow they look better. I mean, the, the thing is, it's it's what we talked about before we were on air with the show. Is like, how can you actually believe in in Rogue to like win <laughs> playoffs know. until you see? Like, it's so hard to actually believe they're not going to choke until you see them not choke. But for right now, like. They look like the best team in LEC. We can at least say that. Like, yeah, sure, they've looked like the best team in LEC before. I think the difference this year is that they're gonna they're gonna listen to our show, Thor, and they're gonna know who they right. are. They're gonna be like, yes. all right, let's just stick to our guns. That's our, our recipe. We don't need to become insane to beat like Mad Lions this year or Fnatic this year. We just need to be the best at what we do. And there's enough, there's enough picks for it right now. Like oh, that's the sure. thing about about Odo's bag that we're talking about. Is like his bag isn't just playing only Orn or only Renekton. Like there's other picks that can fluctuate into this that are in different meta. So like, for example, at the world's meta, you have champions like Kennen that are, that are possible. You have champions like Nar that are possible that also oh, classic. fit yeah. in this, this, this genre of like top laners where you can be weak sided and you can still be really impactful um, and team fight better. And that's, that's the distinction too, is like Odo's good at like losing lane gracefully and then team fighting really, really well. Yes. And that's what all these champions do. So I want to just see more of it. I like the, the angle that they took versus Vitality. I feel like that's that just showed that like when Vitality is playing what Vitality plays best right now and Rogue is playing what Rogue plays best right now, Rogue is a better team. Want we'll yeah. to see if Vitality can actually up their level, but that's a good place to start if you're Rogue. The one angle I'll tie into historically though, because this is where again, actually, as much as I was critical of the coaching staff in past years, like for a third year with slightly different players again, they've done it again. They've got one of the best teams. But here's what I'm going to watch out for, mate. For me, I always felt like they were the worst coaching staff at adapting, though. They figured the problems out immediately, the roster. They've done it every single time. They very quickly figure out how the roster should play, and they sort of get the blueprint. They get like, how, like this is how you're going to play. His, he's going to do this. We're going to have these picks. It's like you've got, the, let's say the first five to six weeks, you've got it nailed. But they are the team where if the patch changes, if another team gets really good, if someone figures out something about them, I've always felt like they didn't seem like they always adapted that well. And often it felt to me like they sort of just let the players keep playing the same way, even if it started to not work. So that's what I'm interested to see is, will this just be the best way they can play? Because you said it last week, they looked like they were a meta-dependent team, potentially in terms of the picks. Like if some picks go totally the other way, how will they survive? That's what I'm looking for as we go further through the split personally. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking for that. Um, but I also think that Marong actually, I mean, uh, Marong like gets like, better every week, right? He's been looking really good. I'm worried about like that type of play style because I mean, when you're really volatile like that, you can, you can have some real in games. Like you can ruin a couple oh, games sure. pretty fucking badly. So I think that he's somebody who might prevent, prevent them from falling into that, like over passivity that they did before. And I think that inspired was definitely more like efficiency based or Marong sure. is way more willing to like 
look like an idiot if it means winning the game and like he just wants to hit timers and be in lanes with when when he needs to be. So I feel like he's the person that if you see Marong fall off, that's gonna it's gonna be just rogue rogue three point. He's the canary in the coal mine. Yeah, definitely. The canary he's in the chalk just, mine. Or whatever. Yeah, exactly. He's the canary in the choke mine <laughs> okay. right there. there go. It's gonna live and die on this guy in playoffs. If he's playing like the best jungler in LEC like he is right now, if he's playing the best like the best jungler in LEC in playoffs, I think this team can legitimately win. If you see him start like running it down a bit, team is fucking doomed. So, okay, a team we should definitely talk about is obviously the Mad Lions. And I notice every week, it feels like, look, I'll give them credit. They're making it entertaining. I never bloody know where this team's at every single week. Don't <laughs> like Some weeks I'm like, wow, they've nailed their identity. They're actually going to low-key be the sleeper. And then the next, they just lose a game. And I'm like, that just looks shit. And actually some of these like traditional role, the, the traditional laners sometimes look under par. Like, fuck, what am I doing here? And even though I have heard constant hype, like I know every, there's loads of like fucking analyst hype for Unforgiven that think he's going to be fucking amazing. Like, the thing is, there are elements of Mad Lions can look really good, and there are some that do look like this is a brand new team. Yeah, I'm. I think that that's that's a huge issue um, with it. But overall, I think that their pieces are fine. Like the two pieces that you're looking at are obviously Unforgiven and Reeker, the two new players. And I feel like Reeker is pretty much where you'd expect him to be if you're saying, "Hey, you're a rookie." Is he good enough for them to be a winner, though? From what you've seen this far, obviously, again, we've only right seen now, four no. weeks. Yeah, yeah, right now, definitely not. Yeah, but, that's the issue. I mean, I, I think that he's somebody who who can improve like i think he's shown me he's shown me good and bad games okay. but obviously he's way too inconsistent right now for them to be a championship team but i mean he doesn't have to be as good at, uh, no it's like you were saying about right that now. topic last week about the if people want more about the vethio one last week we had a whole side but it's like the the topic there he's like a summer player potentially maybe that's when he hits his peak right yeah or, or even maybe by playoffs they they are able to utilize him in a way where he's good enough where the team can can win games um first first the top teams I think that the, the issue is there's like so much randomness with how randomness with how they play. Uh, yep. I mean, Armut, you never know what you're going to get out of this guy. This guy is like inting half the game super hard. I still don't know if he's good, dude. Like, I know that, I know that sounds like a hit. I've said it every split, dude. I know that sounds like a hater. <laughs> yeah. But the no, problem is when I see his bad games, I'm like the hater. I'm like, good. No, that's who he is. Fuck. The guy's got everyone. Look, look, he's garbage. He's garbage. But then every time I turn around to do that, like he has a good game. Oh, fuck, he carried me. Uh, I yeah. couldn't even hit on him because of the Wukong picks. I used to be like... If he's picking Wukong every time, how can he be good? And then he just did win loads of them against good teams. I was like, shit, that is pretty good, actually. Shit. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I don't know. Like, I'm on the other side of it where I actually believe he's good. And then every single time that he's bad, I'm like the type of guy that's, come on, Armut. What are you doing? Right. Like, okay. Armut, stop fucking trolling. Like, focus up and win this goddamn game. Like, what are you doing right now? That That's how I feel. I'm on the other side where I, I think he's good. And when he does, like, really ridiculous shit, when he just runs it down, I'm like, come on, Armut. Like we know here's a question I have for you. Do you think as a top laner you can play that super variable style? Because in that sense, by the way, dude, he reminds me a bit of Whipple. I used to think Whipple was actually underrated even by Fnatic fans because they always used to make it sound like he ran it down every game. And I was like, dude, even sometimes when he ran it down, he had like impact on the game, you know. So to me, it's like I but the problem is I will say I think it's hard to be really consistent if the top laner just didn't start the games. Yeah, sure. I, I think that, that that's a huge issue. But normally around playoffs, he starts becoming better at that. Like he stops inting. He actually becomes one of the best players on the team in, in, in playoffs. So I feel like Armut is different. It's not like he's perma flipping where he's taking a bunch of like 50 50 fights and either okay. it works or it doesn't. It just feels like some games he just plays like shit. Like it's just like he's he's just running it down. Not as so it's more like he's inconsistent. He's like not truly focused at times compared to like his play style being right. Like just incorporating a lot of variants into his own play style, yes. I would say. And I will say, because obviously we can attest to this from that crackdown episode. He is someone who sort of, I mean, this is mad for a rookie to say, but fair play, if you win the championship, you can get away with yeah. it. He did just come in and sort of be like, don't really sort of like league as a game or practicing it much, but like, I'll just do it when I have to. So I think I imagine he's on the old G2 train of like, he's sort of funny in a bit at the beginning of the split. And then as you say, when the games become more important, I'm sure that's when he focuses in a bit, starts playing more and thinks more about what he's doing, you know? Well, I, th I think the thing about Armut that I like the most is that he like is honest with himself when he runs down a game. Like he doesn't try to like yeah, find sure. excuses or like reasons as to why he ran it down. He's like, yeah, I fucking ran it down because yes. that guy played better than me. And then like next time, if I just play better, then I'll be able to win. Yes. Like it's, it's that simple. And I like when people don't overcomplicate those types of things and get really in their own mind about, oh, the matchup or maybe like I can't win this match. He's like, no, if I, I'm just not going to fucking run it down next time. That's the solution. Yes. If I don't run it down, then I won't die at level six. To, to Gwen and completely like lose the whole game right there. We have Renekton in Italy's draft that's centered around my pick actually being strong throughout the early game. So I think Mad Lions has a couple of issues. Uh, I think their, their drafts are kind of all over the place. Like every now and then they'll, they'll do like a draft that you like, but it just feels like they're, they're doing too many different drafts, right? Like 
Like, oh, everything seems like it has to be a surprise or a weird fucking pick. It's never like a just a standard mm-hmm. comp, right? For me, that's a, that's at least how I feel. Like, think about like the early games they had the Diana Yasso games. Okay, sure, they play Diana Yasso. Then Diana is getting banned. Now they have like these random like this Nidalee Redacted game. Where the fuck did that come from? I don't know. Like and Fleet Footwork Nidalee too. It's just too weird, man. Like we just need to calm down, play the normal stuff. Like El Yoyo is still one of the best junglers. Just put him on, you know, Zin Zhao, Jarvin, like Diana if it's up, Lee Sin. Like just put him on those picks and he'll he'll be fine. He doesn't need to you know, be the mastermind. I will also say, by the way, one thing I also appreciate about Armour is he actually seems almost like impervious to banter. Because if you remember, when I sort of tried to, I did the Thorin approach where basically to see if you can get the spicy answer, you just put the fucking full court press on him. Like, well, you talk, look, you might have won the championship, mate, but I thought, you know, fucking Rogue was giving you the business those first few games. He was just sort of like, yeah, I was running it down. You're right. It's like, shit. Because you have to be, yeah, that just neutralizes you immediately. If they just agree, it's like, well, shit, I've got off and then I'm like, they've done me. You've actually done me on that one. It's a fair play. I'll give you that one. I'll give you that one. Yeah, for free. I, I, I like his attitude. I like Armut's attitude. I think that's that's part of probably the reason why I'm not an Armut hater. I'm more on the side of like yeah, just yeah. believing in him and having confidence. It's like he just normally and he shows up when it matters. To so me, like yes. So, so for example, I mean, I thought about you know worlds. Like I think that at worlds he was one of their better oh, players. Sure. I think other people were were performing a lot worse than expected. I think humanoid, based on how insane he was in summer, did not show up at that level. Fuck, yeah. And like Armut had some fucked up games to play. He had that game where he was playing what, like Nar versus Kennen, and his jungler yeah. just comes and like feeds him like two kills a, a, in a tie break. And he's still somehow Armut's still relevant throughout the whole game. So I actually think that this is like the type of guy whose mentality compensates for whatever like skill difference he might have, which is kind of like similar to like Adam in a way, where I feel like there because that guy is confident and like believes in himself, it doesn't matter that he might not technically be as good. That is a huge advantage when you get into like. Yes. A, a series or a lane phase or whatever. Yeah, that's actually one thing I'll say. I've got a couple of points on that. Funny thing you said it there because I don't want to interrupt you, but basically that's exactly how, one of the reasons. I don't actually dislike Armour. Like I said, I actually enjoyed his personality. And plus he's got a cool story. Like the way he came out of TCL, he's won the championship, etc. Like mm-hmm. here's the thing though. I definitely, the reason I disliked him was his fans were overrated the fuck out of him those first few splits, especially. Oh, they, it's like Adam. They just tried to make him be, like essentially if someone's a good player, but you're just like, no, he's the best. It's like, like you already are going to sort of make me hope he fucking fails that it shows that you're just wrong in that scenario. So I think Adam's a good example as well. Because another thing I think is an underrated like psychological comport of Lee. And this is something actually I learned, fully enough, from my old pal Forgiven, which is especially when you're talking about laning, for example, one of the most underrated concepts goes like this. A lot of players, the way you know they're not super comfortable on this champion or in their role, like they don't think they're the best, is they wait for the opportunity to seem clear, like I can push in this lane. I can now harass with this champion. I can go for this attack. He is weak. Unless they get like the confidence vibes, they feel like it should all work out. A lot of them, they won't pull the trigger. What I notice with people, and this is what I learned from Forgiven, is when you notice that in other players, and by the way, at the pro level, there's a lot of guys like this. What you do is you abuse that. You don't. You might not even be on the better matchup, but you abuse the fact that if you step forwards and they're not sure they're supposed to, they, they back off. They let you take the they take the harass. They let you hit them when they hit the minion. Like that's a real style. Now listen, someone like Forgiven obviously took it too far because he was trying to be like Uzi I, just fucking master one approach or whatever. But that that if you as you say, it, we just describe it as confidence because that's what they'll say in interviews. Again, players aren't super articulate, but that's what to me people like Adam were doing. They were taking pictures like that probably shouldn't work, but he would just go for it. And the other and I'm pretty sure the other. Guy I would go like it, he'd have to die a couple of times and be like, What the fuck? How is he doing this to me? Like, this shouldn't, you know, that thing. It's like wonder back. This shouldn't work. Like, there's plenty of people have that fucking story, mate. The problem is, this is why the game's the game is more than just your hands, it's also psychological. It's how you're seeing the other points, so what you even think is possible. Yeah, and it's evidence in their picks, right? Like, they both have a pick that they play when they think it's good, what? And they're, yeah, they're, they're really, really good on. So, you have Wukong for Armut and you have Darius for Adam. And when they pick those ga- those picks in those games, generally it's going to be like a strong performance from them like because they just know those champions on another level, which a lot of people won't do. A lot of people won't go yes. back to like one of their really good <laughs> champions um, because they just feel like, oh, it's not in the meta. It's not actually that good right now. Well, if the other guy knows as much as about the champion as I do, it's really easy to counter, for example. So they get psyched out of being themselves and neither of those players do it. But 
I mean, obviously Adam has, I mean, we could go to BDS next, but yeah, yeah, but I've got a quick side point on that though. I've got a quick point on that though. There's one thing though about that that spins into a draft concept that I hate, dude, which is, you know, when T, one of the other reasons, if you have an off meta pick, it's not in the meta and it's not supposed to win. And crucially, they're not playing it in like Korea and doing amazing shit with the best player. When you do that, the amount of Western coaches whose ego is hurt and they go like this, Dom, well, the thing is, it shouldn't work. So let him take it. We can deal with it. Mate, we can deal with it. It's one of the most famous set of last words in League of Legends history. Because in that scenario, in certain metas, if you just literally, even though to everyone else it's a wasted ban, it ain't a wasted ban against them. Like if it's the right matter, better, and I can take Darius away from Adam, I'll do it immediately. That might be one of my first bans out the gate, dude. Because just because it, then it's like, right, I'll prove that me, you can do it with something else. I'm not going to do that where it's like, eventually, the joke is he doesn't even play League of Legends, he plays Darius, and then sometimes the game makes him pick other things when it's not available. Like in that scenario he's made it a skill matchup it isn't whatever we think it is from the rest of the team you know yeah definitely i mean that's that's leading into a concept that i'm going to be going over in depth which is like why teams blunder draft and how the draft actually functions because i feel like a lot of people become way too like they they become way too narrow-minded when it comes to what type of factors are going into a draft at different points and it's not as simple as like oh well this pick is good here you have to know who you, the fuck you're playing with and, and who you're playing against. Yes. If you have Armut on your team, it doesn't need to be the perfect Wukong game. He's played Wukong in horrible matchups. I mean, we remember what, what happened in, uh, in, in game five. There was an interview yes. with Mac where he picked <laughs> Wukong and somebody asked him, like, how is the Wukong versus Karma matchup? Or maybe it was game three. It was one of these fucking games in, in finals of spring. Like, how's the matchup? He said, it's completely fucking unplayable. <laughs> and then, I love it. I love it, though, dude. I love it. I know. Imagine being his teammate and hearing that. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, he's like, oh, no, this is a horrible matchup. Like, I'm I know. shit on. But, I love it. You know, I'll still be relevant. I love it. The game, so just fucking take it. I, I love I know. when players are, are willing to, to just play what they think is going to fucking win. At the end of the day, it's competition. And League is just not like, if you know how to play your champion better than the enemy, that counts for something. It's not like, they have drafted fucking no. Exodia. We automatically lose based off like, no, like your play in the game actually fucking matters. Yes. And you being a specialist is actually useful in, in, in some situations. So dude, honestly, fuck it. Just bring back some Wukong. If you need some desperate wins for Mad Lions, throw a Wukong game every now and then, you know, let somebody pick Jace, you pick Wukong into it. Boom. Enjoy a couple free victories until people start banning it again. Because that's the thing I just think about, dude. I just imagine being like his teammate. And he says, <laughs> so, it's like, you must have that, like, like that meme with the beard on the neck. Like, <laughs> you know, like when there's that kid at that table, like, trying not to come on. Like, it was like the, the Hillisong uh, picture that everyone always memes where it's like, Dylan, we have to go yes. Vayne. And like, you see like Hilly just, what the fuck? Like you're actually picking Vayne mid in competitive. Like this is what we're risking our whole season on. I love that. I love that in fucking players, man. No, another thing I'm with, by the way, because I'll give you a quick side point. I brought it up on shows before, but I'll do it again for the fans, whether you are fans. Right. You know, everyone now is doing this thing where like, because he doesn't play the game, so he can't have a bad game and look bad. Double lift now has become like the fucking, they think he's like the fucking Hakage from like Naruto or something. He's just a wise old man who everything he says is just glittering wisdom. The thing about double lift has always been like, as I've known this guy since literally 2012, here's what happens. He just talks a lot. And there almost seems to be no like sensor between his brain and his mouth. The words just flow continually. Every now and then, though, he'll just hit like a stream of like lucidity where he'll say some amazing shit. And you're like, yeah, like that's deep as fuck. Yeah, right. Remember that was that was pretty good. Listen, that was that was when I felt like he was coming to the light at that point in time. He was like fucking born again. No, because for example, I'm not exaggerating. Back in the day, in 2013 at Worlds, he was the first Western player I actually met who understood the concept. You don't just play what seems like the the best global meta you just play your style to the best you can he got it back then because what he realized was he thought the european team is going to be way worse and obviously they were way better and he was like fuck it's because actually they have their style whereas we're just trying to like copy someone else he could he figured that out in 2013 now listen he couldn't apply it to his game he couldn't apply it to tsm so this is the problem right double lift also years later when he was in tsm did an infamous i think it was an interview where he, it was either an interview or a talk show where he basically said and this is, it's a classic pro player, like stupid thing to say. He goes, because he obviously thinks I'm double lift. I played all these years. He goes, I think I just take the nameplates off. At the end of the day, you play against the champions. It's like, mate, that might make sense in solo queue. That would even be good advice. That is the dumbest pro player advice I've ever heard. Because what it implies, Dom, is that say, I mean, I'll even make it, I'll make it fair. I'll make it. So let's say he was on Team Liquid and he's playing against TSM. 
Oh, they're Midlands picking Zillion. I don't know who their Midlander is. Great. We, we won the matchup, right? We're going to dick on this game. <laughs> Guess what? That Zillion is going to be very different from the random Zillion that, like, fucking who he would have played if he was a Midlander. You know, like, like, in that scenario, mate, like, I'm sorry. I think history is borne out that absolutely there are certain players with certain champions. That is, you do not take the nameplate. It's the opposite. You look at the fucking nameplate. The nameplate actually is more important than the champion. Yeah. I mean, we saw an example of that uh, recently with, with EDG and one of their yes. mic checks where, where they were just talking about like, hey, like, based on how the series goes, if you do this with me, even if you lose top, like, the whole yes. the whole game is over. And it's like not, uh, it's it's like a jungle invade that JJ calls Flandre to do that's going to put Flandre behind. But they just know in the moment that based off, like, external factors, not what's happening <laughs> right there in the game, there's no way, like, in that level one, they just look at both team comps and like, yeah, you know what? An invade will just completely end the game. They, they know in that circumstance because it's game five in the finals of Worlds and like how the series has gone. JJ just had a monster game. Canyon had a not so good game in a row, like just back to back. You just know that like they're reading the actual situation and it's more than just the champions. So of course you don't want to like disrespect people and play really stupidly because you think they're better than them. You shouldn't like ego on people just because their nameplate she says that they're bad. Like if you're laning bot lane, I mean, I'm just going to fucking say if you're bot laning bot lane into Jesu, like, and you're like, oh shit, like, you know, he's bad. I'm just going to dick him in lane. You play like he's just not good. Then you could get caught. And that's how you could lose some of those trap yes. games. But in reality, like you need to understand what people's strengths and weaknesses are. And you have to play the player as well as like the champions. It's not just a fucking game of robots playing against each other. Yes. Um, also, I'll just say as a quick aside, another thing that's silly about letting people do what they're strong at is they're in their fucking comfort zone. Like, I, there's another thing. Even if someone's sometimes good on another pick, like he looks like he's equally as good. If I know he's not as comfortable, mate, I'll go there all day long. Let's put let's put him in a scenario where he thinks, fuck, I wish I was on this or oh, I could have done this or what about that. No, I, I love when you do that. So anyway, a team we have to talk about now, it's the weekly hit on Excel segment because we've got some extra content on this one we're going to go into. But basically, people don't okay. know. Excel, we talked about the swap last week. Advien went out, obviously he wrote like his little sob story. It was pretty sad, I have to say. I felt pretty much pretty hard done by. He did a good job nailing all the points, you know. Like essentially, he was like, you know, I hope to sort of grow into a good player. They didn't give me that chance. Like, yeah, well played. They brought yep. in Mickey X, who listened on paper. Yes, of course, great player, blah, blah, blah. Well, many reasons you'd bring him in. But this is the new drama. First of all, they lost immediately to Mad Lions, which looked pretty fucking suspect. And then they beat a bad team. So I can't really say we've done anything with the move yet. Like, it's not like it's already won. It's like, yeah, it's all looking up. So it's questionable already, the move still. And then the more important part is, you showed me this. There's an interview on esports.com with Patrick, obviously, in theory, the best player on the team, if you look at history. And the, obviously, the, the player they basically build around for the last few years. And you would expect, right, if you think about the way Newsly team orgs either A, for real do it, or B, message it, you're normally meant to always claim that the players were on board with the move. It's why I've even actually, as a sidebar, sometimes made fun of people where they're like, but the players said it was good. It's like, I don't give a fuck what the players say. What if they, you know, what if they're wrong? But in this case, Patrick essentially says, I mean, he tries to soft sell it a little bit by making it sound like, you know, but Big X is good or whatever. It basically sounds like if I read between the lines, he didn't make this cho choice. I'm, I think he's implying he wouldn't have made this choice. And it sounds like the whole team wouldn't have made the choice. And actually, whether for right or wrong, they would have stuck with Advien. And they actually, I think actually, if you look at whether the fact that like lost most of the games, they, if this doesn't, if Mickey X doesn't really work out, this could kill the team, dude. I have that, I have that vibe about like the, the sort of, it, it just, I had it was something he, he didn't he wasn't that harsh in the interview people go and read it but I was I would get a bad vibe when I was reading his response mate uh, yeah I feel like there's more and maybe not a rift between the team but a rift between like management and the team because I feel like right. when you're when you're on a team you, there's like a certain like like unspoken like contract between you and your organization where it's like you're gonna have some level of faith in us to like show you what we can do and then like at times where there needs to be changes everyone will feel it it's like we don't if we don't deliver a certain level of result sure you can you know, make whatever changes you think um, are needed. But in reality, like players want to to have time to actually show what they're worth. And clearly two weeks is not enough to, to fucking show if this, this roster was going to work or not. And even in those two weeks, they did have good moments. It's not like you could say, oh, this team is going to be fucking shit. Forever. No, no. When we, when we discuss them on the show, we're like, yeah, they're, they're probably fighting like six or seventh, uh, fighting for six or seven, six or seventh place with misfits. That was the tier that we put them in. So for me, the biggest issue of this whole situation is when he's talking about it, he, in this interview, he says, yeah, Mickey X is like a little bit more quiet than Advian, which is to me the most damning part. Weird because comment, isn't it? Yeah. The way that they tried to sell Mickey X to us was he's the one with the, the winner's mentality. Yes. He's going to like inject that. But if you have somebody who 
has that mentality or whatever, and they're just super fucking quiet in the game. What, what good does that do? Like, how does that actually help the team improve? So to me, it just becomes weirder and weirder the way that we have the swap. And then also, I don't know if Patrick should say that, honestly. Like, I feel it's like- It's a bit wild, yeah. You could, it's, you're gambling that now Mickey X feels a bit off, right? Exactly. That's the issue is yeah. like, at, at this point, what's done is done. You have Mickey X on your team. You don't have Advian on your team. Like, I feel like making Mickey X feel at home, like I would fucking lie to that guy's face. If he showed up next to me, I'd be like, thank God you're here, Mickey, man. I, I, was, I was telling management, I can't wait until we have a player. Like, you're like, I would want this guy to be on my side the entire time. Like, I wouldn't want to- sure. To tell him like, hey, man, welcome to the team. By the way, none of us wanted you here. You see all four yes. of us. Yeah, we all fucking hate you. But since you're here, I mean, we're going to try our best. Anyway, yes. load into the fucking game. Like, I feel like that's not when he's going to be succeeding or he's going to be in his in his uh, putting his best foot forward. So to me, the issue is just like, I can understand him feeling like that. And I can understand that being the truth. I don't think it's a good idea to publicize that. No, when no. your teammate can just fucking read that shit. It's like, oh, so you guys didn't want me here. Okay, nice. Like, that, this, that must feel pretty fucked Dude, up. for me, that's also another area, though, where it's like cultural difference. Like, again, if you notice the sort of area, I think Patrick yep. is from the Czech Republic. Am I right? Yeah. I think he is, right? These are also, like, that was where Freeze was from. These are also those countries, a bit like Perks from Croatia. That they're, they're are just way a bit more, more hardcore. Yeah, they were. They just Straight saw it, it, their logic. It's a bit like me. They just think, right, if I tell the truth, but it is the truth, then somehow it'll all work out. And it does in some ways, but the problem is it works out like eventually. It doesn't always work out now. Like there's a reason why people do white lies and they tell you something that's not quite true, but they don't want to hurt, they don't want to hurt your feelings, you know, because as you're saying in this scenario, like it's not even the beginning of the split, dude. Like if the beginning of the split, you could get a few games in, you know, we win a cup. You're already under the fucking hammer, as it were. Like you're down in the in the league. By the way, we've just listed all those other teams that are looking way better, including misfits. Like at this point in time, you guys need to rapidly turn the split around. You need to start getting like the 75% win rate now if you want to be competent and actually like challenge for the top spot. So to me, either like it works out amazingly, which I can only see, like you said, Smithy X a pretty quiet guy. It has to come from him literally just popping the fuck off himself or yeah, you're right. Maybe I, maybe we want to say kill the team because that makes it sound like the team itself implodes. I mean, kill the team more like 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 no one's going to believe in the coaching staff, are they? Because the problem with that move is this: it's the difference between players and and coaches. Right, a coach in theory. There's actually a move Bill Belichick was infamous for in the NFL. If they really believe it's just the better move long term, they sometimes do it and say, "I'll take it on the chin if it doesn't work initially." And even if I've sort of let a good player go, like if people don't know, Bill Belichick legitimately let Randy Moss go when he was still like one of the best wide receivers in the whole fucking NFL. Spoiler, he was right. He went to the next year. It was the 49ers. He was, just got, he was just done. He was just done after that. But the problem is, if you're the teammates of that guy, this is a thing I want to quickly get into with you. I've noticed teammates, they don't, it's not like they remember every game they played with you, but they remember all the good moments, how, that, how, that, how it felt like it was cool to be your teammate or a great moment in the game. Like you did something amazing. You synced up with them. And that's why they can often seem, quite frankly, like idiots when they hold on to a player for too long. Because in their mind, they're still romanticizing. Oh, but if he can get back to it, like wonder, but if he ever gets back to that, or if he does what he's doing in scrims, dude, you don't know, he'll tear the league up. And so they'll hold on way longer than a coach will. So the problem I have with it is, like, obviously it depends on the specific case. Sometimes the coaches are right. I've seen them do moves that were upgrades that maybe someone else wouldn't do. Maybe they like that player and thought he's good. At and the, the, the killer words, he's good enough. They do that, you know. Sometimes you have to do it. My problem in this one is, it seems like everyone's on a different page. Like, I don't, there's one thing as well I want to know, dude. Where the fuck's Mickey X with this? How does he actually <laughs> feel? Because we never know, right? He was already a guy where he always seemed, this is what's weird, even though he has a funny sense of humor, even when G2 with the Kings, he always had like a very quiet vibe even then, you know. He's more yeah. the guy who like laughs at a joke rather than gets involved in it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that that it's definitely a rough spot to be to be Mickey X. And yeah, I mean, one thing I wanted to, to, to talk about is like, I don't even know if it's the coaching staff that made this move. I mean, a lot of what I'm hearing when I when I hear like upper management, I'm thinking about like people way right. above coaching staff. So maybe... Maybe the coaching staff didn't even want this either. So this might be like a completely like oh. weird divide between if people like don't know as well. I believe the owner of Excel's a guy that I don't know. He's from like UK esports. He's from like other games. I think he might be from Call of Duty or something, dude. I'm not even dissing the guy or right? anything. But as a result, that, that's a move where I wonder, did he just like do the Liquipedia move of like, this guy's a champion. We've got to get him in the This guy will sell all yeah. spots. But yeah, if you're a player, you're like, bro, like that's, it's not as simple as just plugging him in. Like we have to know that he's going to bring someone to the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And then I think the other, the other part is like, I wonder how much is, uh, of that is like when Patrick says something like that publicly, trying to be like fair to Advian, you know, like to have yes. like his, his yes. like friend or like his, yeah. his former he's doing a favor. Like 
Yeah, like do 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 him a favor. Like I think you could even know. argue, by the way, he might naively think by saying this he'll help Adrian get in another team. It's just he might yeah. not have thought of the consequence on his own team. Yeah, definitely. I think that that's that's something else that, that's being considered. But yeah, I mean, the whole thing is super weird. I mean, obviously they've only played together one week. So yeah, you can't make two big judgments. I mean, they they just look like the same fucking team. If you yes. told me Adrian played another week, I, I would have just I would have believed you. Like I didn't see any noticeable difference. Also, like. The shot calling was just them flipping it at Baron like consistently. They flipped it at Baron like three different times in two games. Nice. Like, all right, nice. We've we've fixed our, our Baron situation. So for me, I don't really know what to make of it. I haven't seen well, here's the thing, Dom. Yet. Next week they play Rogan Fanatic. So here's oh, the thing. unless they heavily fucking level up, the split's basically almost done. Like, look again, it's a world where if you look how bad the bottom teams are, well, we'll get them. BDS. So, tell you what, we'll probably transition that next because BDS for now look like they could take their fucking lunch. So I think next maybe. week, Excel's done unless they, they turn the shit around, mate. Oh, I, I, I maybe. Oh, let me look at their schedule. Okay, so they have Rogue first and then Fanatic. Yeah, no, I think that it's actually going to be almost... That's fucking hard, man. <laughs> it's almost impossible to win any of yes. those games like in, in their current form. They're going to need like some massive draft edge or like Nuke Duck Vigar. It's going to have to be the perfect Vigar game. It's going to be something strange to... To really make this work, I, I think that uh, yeah, they they kind of had the opposite where they had uh, an easy schedule at the beginning that no one really realized was was easier, more like an easy schedule in the middle, yes. and their end of the schedule is hard. So like when you look at them and Vitality right now, they're tied, right? Excel and Vitality are both three and four, but they're not tied at all because Vitality still has to play Astralis, yes. and right now everyone beats fucking Astralis. So yeah, I, I think that uh, Excel to me is already in the seventh place spot, seventh eighth play spot even though their record still indicates that they're tied for sixth all right let's do it then let's briefly even though on past episodes i've sort of said look on this show we're not making it like a two hour three hour thing every time like some other shows so we're just going to stick to the interesting teams and topics and you basically have to do something special to get my attention i'll give you credit look they still haven't played top teams but like bds i have to at least acknowledge that they're doing something like they get they get they're, start, they're starting to come together dom are they I mean, okay, let's see, let's see. So they beat... They looked good beating the bad teams. Okay, so they beat XL yeah. in week one. And then... Oh, okay, so they beat XL, and then they beat Astralis and SK. I mean, look, I don't even think that they're actually better than SK. Like, I just feel like SK into the draft so hard, we didn't even get to see them play. Like, that, that was a series where... Before I, I saw the draft, I thought SK was going to win. And as soon as I saw the draft, I'm like, yeah, they have no chance of, of winning this game. So... I don't know, man. I think BDS is uh, I think BDS is actually just really, really flawed as a team. I, I think it's very hard for them to win because they're just playing with less options than other teams. They don't know how to side lane, which means that, so like if they are playing one of these drafts where they have Olaf for for uh, Adam and then they're playing like a TF, they don't play together on the side. They're just team fighting with TF Olaf into Kennen and they're like, yeah, we hope we fucking win. This team has no depth in terms of, st of strategy. It's like, we're going to play our lanes <laughs> And then come to a team fight and then hope we win the team fight. They don't know what the fuck they're doing. So for me, I think I think this team is uh they're living on the back of Synchrov. I think Synchrov's jungle is the best player by far, man. I think so too. I, th I think Synchrov is 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 really good. Um, I think his pathing is good. A lot of people were telling me that's that a, he... dude, that's underrated though, don't you think? Like at the moment, if you look at all the junglers, bear in mind he's on a bottom team, like we've described, he's doing fucking pretty well. And usually this is why this is key. Normally the junglers are what is supposed to look shit when your team's bad. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he, he's one of the people that actually views each game like I'm going to path in the best way possible. Like he's thinking about every single thing that he's doing in the game, which I love to see in a jungler because sure. you can get sucked into like, I'm just going to full clear. I'm clearing from here, from point A to point B. I want to end up bot side. So I start top side and I'm just going to clear until I end up there. You know, like he's one of the people that is really thinking of how do I fuck over this enemy jungler? Like how do I punish this enemy jungler's pathing, which I like. I, I think that that's a huge strength um, from Synchrov. I just think that Normally, that's not a recipe for winning games when you play against top teams because there's going to be a point where you're not going to be as useful anymore and you're not going to be the one that's going to be splitting and knowing like how many waves can I push here? Do I need to like, do I need to like push and roam after this wave? Do I need to push in base? Can I keep on pushing? Like all those types of decisions that you make in the sideline don't have almost anything to do with jungle. Like jungle is never going to be calling a top laner. Oh yeah, push these two and then come like, we're not micromanaging people on this level. And I don't even know if Synchro would be able to like understand what Adam doesn't know. I think the problem is that nuclear Int and Adam both don't know how to play the side lane. Oh, so like they're just, for sure, yeah. they're, they're kind of fucked in that regard. So, I mean, I'm expecting them to be uh, going zero two this week as well. Here's my take though. I'm not, look, I'm not saying they can win or do something in the playoffs, but for me, 
as XL is going to hit this bad patch, they've got a chance to take that last playoff spot. They've got a chance to move into that position because here's the thing. Um, like, I, like we've just discussed, I think Synchrov's way better than his position in the league right now and he's doing, doing a lot. And then the key thing is those two players you talked about, the solos, look, I don't give a fuck about X-Mat. Like, I've always thought he was fucking washed or rather he never made it. He just, he just <laughs> People tried to hype him from Fnatic and everything years ago. He never made it, mate. Like he's just an ERL player. So personally, I expect him to be moving on after this year. So he's one year in LEC, enjoy it via con Dios, mate. But this is my problem. When you have a pretty good jungler and one who's not just like, it's not just, just making out players, like you say, he's actually fucking playing the map correctly. Seems like he has a good game plan for playing better teams and opponents. Those two solo laners, it just takes one of them to start to get their shit together a bit, one of them to get a bit more confident. Like, th- there's, there's pieces here where they could at least get into the mix of the fucking playoffs. They're not going to do anything when they're, again, by the way, this is the ultimate team that would just fall apart in the best of five. Logically. Which, which, like, which team you do know? you think will not make playoffs? If we look at the, 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 the six okay. teams that I think are breaking away, right? You have Misfits, Mad Lions, uh, Fnatic, G2, yep. Vitality, and... Oh, fuck, Rogue. yes, I forgot Vitality's record isn't that yeah. good. Yes, that's the part I'm forgetting, shit. You're right, actually. Yeah. So it's I'm like, just I thinking think... of them versus XL. You're right, yes. Vitality's yes. going to beat them, obviously, yes. So it's probably like a seventh place, maybe. That's true. They get their shit together. Yes, that's true. Well, whatever. Yeah, My point was... basically was this. When I saw this lineup initially on paper, I was like, this isn't going to do anything at all, mate. Like, this, that, like, the joke was this could, this could have been a, a last place team. Just not mm-hmm. from skill, like it has some skilled players, but it's like you're saying, each, each player has a flaw next to them. I mean, nuclear, especially, spoiler, when you, when you see this, you'll never be able to unsee it. The only people hyping nuclear the whole time are fucking French people. I wonder why that could be. People haven't noticed. That's just their shit. The same with the Sp- Spaniards. The certain crowds just go hard as fuck for their people. And look, whatever. It's Why just where they, they ride. Just be video fans? Why can't they I know. be video fans? Yeah, I've always thought the same thing, mate. It's like, look, just support the sick player. Don't support all of them. I've never got that, you know. That's it's a weird angle to me. But yeah, anyway. Look, I, I, I guess that is a bit of a moot point now. I've sort of fucking couched in. Right, let's do it then. The last team to talk about. That's right, SK and Astralis. Go fuck yourself. Do something worth talking about. Then we'll talk about... I mean, at the moment, we'll give you a 10-minute segment to bash you sometimes about how you dog shit your org is. But let's talk about <laughs> Vitality. Because obviously, the thing with Vitality oh. is, generally, yeah, like, as much as the first week looked bad... This is where it's funny. Normally, people have recency bias, and the last game's all you think of. I feel like that first week is still in the back of people's brains, where it's like they can't allow themselves to believe Vitality really is one of the best teams now, because they are. Yeah, I I mean, I think that this team is actually pretty solid. Like, maybe they're not as good as Rogue right now. I mean, they're they're definitely not as good as Rogue. Maybe they're not as good as Fnatic either. Like, we'll have to see on that. But I mean, this week, I mean, for them versus Misfits, I think they're slight favorites in that matchup. And then Vitality yes. versus Astralis, that should just be a win. So like... There's a 2-0, they, they yeah. Went, they went 0-3. And the worst they could be looking at, in my mind, is like 4-5 and five, halfway through, where they had a horrible week one super week. And played a like bunch of the best teams. Yeah, I think that's fine. I think yes. that's fine. They've only had one bad loss yes. the entire split, right? Like the one bad loss that they had was to XL. They should not have lost to XL. That was a fucking terrible game. That was the Vex game where... Perks had Ignite, and he just kind of ran it. Like, that was definitely a very rough game. Outside of that, it's fine. Like, Vitality versus Fnatic, yeah, the, I would have assumed that Fnatic was going to beat them in that one. Then Vitality versus Mad, I mean, we didn't really know how good Reeker and Unforgiven are. It looks like Reeker's pretty okay, and then, like, Unforgiven looks good to me. So, I think that's a reasonable loss as well. It's really And they, get, they gave Rogue loss. a decent game. Yeah, and they, yeah, I think they played There's nothing wrong well with that. Rogue. Yeah. This last two weeks is exactly the level that I would have yes. expected them at. I think that they're looking like a third, fourth place team. That this is why, by the way, than... this is a take that has aged like a motherfucker. It's wine, like from the fucking best French region for uh, t- thematically fitting, which as I said after week one, as mad as it sounds, even though, yes, they're into the fuck out of the games, I want them to do that because essentially I want them to figure out totally where all the strengths lie, where the weaknesses lie, but essentially push through. All, essentially like, it's like Caps' old style, in to win. In to figure out how to be really good. Because in doing so, dude, they've started to. After that first week, which was terrible, it's like actually everything just came more and more and more and more together. And now it's really solid. Like you said, you can actually rely on certain players now. You can even rely on picks. And this is the key for me. This team was always going to be about if you can integrate self-made to the team. Because clearly he's a massive talent. It's just that he has, there's something about him that, Sometimes he doesn't vibe with players or he doesn't, he's not on the same page of how they want to play the game. And I've always thought he's the guy where, some of this is speculation, some of it's from teammates. He's the guy where it's like, this is the one negative I have for him. Forgiven my old pal, who I often contrast him with, he just 
straight up would tell you, I'm not going to play Siva, Jin. Like, I just won't play them. I don't, Callista, I don't even care if, you, if it's the best now. I Because I don't believe it, I won't play it. Mostly, players aren't that big of an asshole. What players tend to do is this. They go... I don't want to play it though. And then they play a scream. It goes badly. Look, coach, it doesn't work. And then the coach goes, believe me, can you trust me? Okay. You can play it this week. And he goes, all right, I'll play it. But they sort of play it like half assed And yep. then when it loses, they go, look, I'm just saying, if that had been, you know, in, in this case, whatever it could be, fucking Xin Zhao. Yeah. If that was that, I'm just saying, probably could have got, you know, I could have got that kill there. And it's like, in that scenario, that it, people don't get it, but that is low key toxic as fuck. Because what that does essentially is, I, I want everyone to do my ideas. But your ideas, I'm not really committed, but I've got to pretend I am because otherwise I get kicked out of the team. So it's like, also, so that's the thing with me. So far, especially the last few weeks, it feels like they've got that connection now. And like I said, you mate, anytime self made really does have a good game, this guy is fucking mega at the game. He's just a fucking monster. Yeah, he's really good. I, I, I like I like watching self made a lot. I know what you mean. Like, I still see that. Like, you can tell just by the way he plays that he enjoys certain picks more. Oh, like, for sure. His Kiana is a completely different thing. And I don't think it's just that he's better at a Kiana than a Xin Zhao. I can just tell that he doesn't really want to be playing Xin Zhao. Like, he doesn't want to be playing Xin Zhao. Maybe he'll play Olaf every now and then. But, like, this guy has has a few spicy picks that he yes. really prefers. Like, he wants that Gwen game to work. Like, he really wants that Gwen game to work, that Kiana game to work. He wants to be able to play, like, an Eve game at some point and actually, like, For sure. pop off on it. He just has picks that, that, that fit more in his play style. So, for me... I know what you mean. I completely see that that type of vibe uh, with him, but I still think that like he's going to res- like. I think that it really comes down to how much he respects his teammates. Absolutely. When I look at the yeah. players that he's playing with, I think it's a much better fit for him to actually you know get to where he yes. where he wants to be because he's not going to disrespect any of these players. I mean, it's Alfarian yes. perks. Like he knows that if he's not winning with Alfarian perks and his uh, as his soul lanes, he's not winning. Like his career, yes. he's just going to be. A player that I was like, oh, he was really good. He might have even been the best of times, but he wasn't a champion. He didn't have what it takes yes. to be a champion. Yeah, if people don't get the contrast, this is one of those areas where, again, I can't say things I've heard privately from teammates. I can only infer them and build them into my idea and wink, wink. And if you're smart enough, spoiler, most of you aren't, so don't worry about it. You might pick <laughs> up that I actually know what I'm talking about. And yes, some of it's speculation. So I'll say again, I'm mixing a little bit of the two. On paper, and if you watched streams, spoiler, Obviously, take all Dom's comments, his are great and stuff, but most streamers, they're just saying certain things on camera that they wouldn't necessarily say off stream, or maybe they make the opinion a little bit sweeter and they don't make it as mean, you know. Here's what I'll say. If you listen to Nemesis' streams or if you ask Selfmade directly, he's not an idiot, mate. He'll tell you some shit like, oh, of course Nemesis was my boy from back at the day. The way they played together in Fnatic, they looked like they didn't even know each other, mate. Like, it looked to me like Selfmade for real. Him and, uh, for me, the vibe was, it, it was never, he would never have been able to continue with Whipple. I think they fundamentally just didn't like the way, they didn't like each other's attitude, didn't like each other's game. And for me, him and Nemesis was a, a similar scenario in the sense that I just felt like he just jets and Nemesis. He was like, if he's going to play that way, like he's not really like a follow-up play, he's playing a little bit soft, fuck him then, let him play his mage and I'll just be off doing my shit elsewhere. So my problem is like, I'm, I'm with you. I can sort of tell by his actions who I think he really vibes with and actually respects. It doesn't matter what he says on camera. I'm with you, though. If you don't respect Alfari and Perks, like at the end of the day, Perks is like the fucking ultimate winner. And Alfari is just a master at what he does. Like, if you think what he's doing wrong in top lane, sorry, jungler, please shut the fuck up. I'm the top lane. Like, I'm, you're just wrong. You know, like in that scenario, if you can't get along with those players, I, yeah, you're right. The question is what, what the fuck's wrong with you, not what's wrong with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I feel, I feel like the, the players that for self-made that he doesn't get along with, or like he doesn't really vibe with in games or more of like the passive types where he kind of feels like they're just like yep. scared or something. And I feel Dude, like you must like- know it as a jungler, right? It, it suck. Who the fuck wants to go to the lane to help a guy gank with? It's like, he might not even get the kill. He might let the guy escape like with fucking one health under the tower. Like, yep. you know what I mean? Like you don't want it. You, eventually you just start thinking, sorry, I'll use the same analogy. Sorry, fucking Lucy. I'm not going to kick the football this time. Fuck off. You know? Yeah. I mean, look, like, I remember how people were really critical about Voivoy as, as a mid laner when I was a player, and he was my favorite mid laner I ever played with. Like, at that point, like, I think okay. Phoenix was kind of in the same vibe, but, like, up until that point, he was my favorite mid laner I'd ever played with because I could rely on him actually right. doing something in the game. I like playing with Cutie, bro. I don't care if Cutie would suicide, like, three times a game. I don't give a fuck. Like, he was at least playing the game to win. Like, those are the players that I really want to, to, to play with, and I feel like self made the same way. I just don't I just don't think that self-made could pull his bullshit with perks. Like if he started like doing like some of that like prissy bullshit where it's like, nah, well, I'm gonna like, well, and I don't really care about this game. Like perks will fucking put that guy in his place. So I, I just feel like this is actually a really good matchup to see if he actually has it in him. Like if he's not winning with this, this guy's not winning. 
That's it. Like he's, it, it's, he, I don't believe he's going to win a championship if he doesn't win in Vitality. Right, Dom, are you ready? Because here's the thing. You know me. I don't give a fuck what fans say. But being as you are a streamer and half of your entire job is letting those maniacs into your mind and trying to like meet them halfway and understand what they want and how <laughs> yep. to make them... But I don't have to do that, thankfully. I can just be an old boomer who blocks everyone and just give a fuck. Are you ready? <laughs> are we ready for me to do the outro? So I'll do it if you're ready now. Are you ready? Sure. Right, so obviously, if you've enjoyed the show, there'll be more of it next week. We don't know exactly what day yet. So be sure to stay tuned to the same crack host, same crack channel. That's it. We're out.